thank you all for coming. Uh, can you can you hear me? Yeah. Can everybody hear me? All right. Um, so I want to uh, say a couple of words before uh, I get into things tonight. Uh, first, to thank uh, Steve Wagner for his kind introduction. Uh, also, to thank uh, Virginia Jeans Lass and uh, the other members of the Jeans family uh, for their support. Uh, to thank uh, Mr. Southern for having me here. Um, and then uh, a special word of thanks, actually, uh, to uh, to all of you here in, in Java. Uh, this is my first time here. Uh, this is a place uh, that, you know, for many Americans, was a, a place on the map uh, until a couple of years ago. Um, and we have all gotten to know Java very well. I'm going to, you know, try to teach you some kind of lesson about history uh, tonight, but I want to thank you as a community uh, for teaching America about community and about perseverance. So I just want to take a second. Uh, I'm also going to start by making a plug for a project that, that I know about and like a lot, but that I'm not myself involved in. Uh, it's a pro project called Over There, Missouri and the Great War. Uh, and this is a, a statewide collaborative digitization project uh, that is based in the Springfield Green Library System. Um, and it aims to document the roles of uh, Missourians from uh, both uh, at home and abroad, um, including the 69,000 who served abroad during World War I. And the project is aiming at digitizing collections in both public and private collections around the state uh, and to launch a big website uh, in 2014 for the centennial of the war. Uh, and so there's a uh, URL here on the, on the screen that you can see. Uh, right now, that website is not fully developed, but you can play a role in developing it. They are looking for, uh, for digital contributions from people from private family collections, anything related to uh, Missouri in the war, both uh, military and war, war civilian. So please uh, you know, uh, go through your ads uh, and see, see what you might have. All right, so let me dive in. I want to uh, start tonight uh, with, uh, with uh, a story of one of America's most familiar images uh, that may not necessarily be familiar as you're looking at it right now. Uh, and uh, what you're looking at is a guy by the name of James Montgomery Black. Now, sitting in his Manhattan studio on a summer day in 1916, James Montgomery Black took off his glasses looked in the mirror, and saw there what became the image of America itself. He was one of the nation's most successful illustrators, and he was 39 years old in 1916, and he was working on a, uh, on a very short deadline for a drawing for the cover of Leslie's Illustrated Weekly newspaper. Now, in an upcoming issue of the magazine, the editors planned to urge Americans to expand the country's military force, to expand our army, just in case world events drags us into the ongoing tragedy that Americans at that point still refer to as, quote, the European War. Now, Flagg, like I said, was under a tight deadline, and he didn't have a lot to work with. He didn't have a model uh, to sketch from. Uh, so he had his own reflection in the mirror. Uh, and if you look at it, you can see sort of tall and lanky. And uh, we know that his eyes were sort of bright and blue, uh, and wavy hair that you see there. He had that to work with. Um, he probably also had this poster, uh, a British military recruiting poster designed by Alfred Wheat in 1914, featuring Lord Kitchener, Britain's Secretary of War and Chief of its Military Recruitment, pointing at the viewer with the words, your country needs you. So Flagg, uh, not actually all that creatively, um, sort of erased the caption, borrowed Kitchener's pose, and substituted his own face for the Brits, uh, then added uh, whiskers, wrinkles, and some gray hair, just for good measure, and with that, Uncle Sam appeared. <laughs> just in time for America's first world war. Now the picture first ran in July 1916 on the cover of Leslie's under the heading, What Are You Doing for Preparedness? Meaning military preparedness. But within a year, despite President Woodrow Wilson's stated intention to keep America out of the war, the nation was already mobilizing young men into the ranks. In the spring of 1917, Flagg's image reappeared, this time on a US Army recruiting poster, with its caption restored, I want you. By the armistice, the War Department had printed more than four million copies of this poster. <laughs> 
and always patriotic, Flagg volunteered during the war as New York State's official military artist. And he even uh, sort of offered a free portrait to anyone who bought a $1,000 Liberty Bond. Flagg composed 46 different posters over the course of two years of military service to the war effort. But of them all, the poster captioned, I want you, has been the most enduring. It's probably the only one that we all recognize. So why has it become one of the most iconic images in American politics? Why has it become, in fact, a visual metaphor for America itself? And I want to suggest that perhaps Americans found that Uncle Sam, like all good uncles, helped them out in a pinch. Uh, he turned the vast machinery of war mobilization into a family affair. He gave political power a personal face. And he made sense of the government's new presence in areas of everyday life in the United States where it, it had not been before. But on closer inspection, Flagg's Uncle Sam is a puzzling figure. He is at once protective and watchful, personable and authoritative, an individual and an institution. And, like many uncles, or at least like my uncles, he is very badly dressed. <laughs> His formal attire conveys the solemnity of war's occasion, and his furrowed brow and piercing stare show his seriousness about the undertaking. But his silly hat and ill-fitting suit suggest that Uncle Sam doesn't usually do this. He reassures viewers that war is not in America's life, <coughs> that the nation, like its uncle, might rather be doing something else. So I think that the poster helped Americans understand their relationship to the wartime government. And when they sought a way to express that new government, that new state, they chose four million times <coughs> to depict Uncle Sam. And it raises several questions. Right? What went through their minds in April 1917, at the beginning of the war, when Uncle Sam pointed at them and said, I want you? Or that fall, with the military draft in full force, as he told them to buy <coughs> off and serve food and keep a vigilant eye on their German neighbors? What did they think of that winter as they faced a rising cost of living and shortages of coal and sugar and as news of American deaths in Europe began reaching their communities? How might that they have felt when they saw that poster vandalized in their neighborhoods? <coughs> did they share the anger of a group of women in New York State who urged Congress to make the defacement of war posters a federal crime? Or were they the ones who had defaced Uncle Sam's poster in the first place? And what did they think on November 11th, 1918, at the armistice, when that same poster, now faded and battered by the elements, was replaced with another announcing a victory to parade? Now, what I want to do for the rest of the evening right, is to try to unpack this image, try to figure out uh, what Americans were thinking uh, when Uncle Sam was looking at them, and what Uncle Sam precisely was looking at in the first place. And it's a way also of thinking about how the American government changed during World War I, um, and also how Americans changed that government, how Americans remade uh, their own system of government during the course of the war. In April of 1917, when the U.S. embarked on its first world war, it had little history of conscription, an army smaller than Bulgaria's, and a political culture that saw little role for the federal government beyond delivering the mail. Now, in the absence of a strong federal government, how would America mobilize for war? The answer to that question was all the more pressing, given how much the war had actually divided Americans. And in fact, we forget just how contested, how conflicted Americans were about World War I. Uh, and this was uh, all across America, but you can find it in communities uh, you know, far, far and wide. Here in Missouri, for example, the war was not entirely popular. Uh, several of the members of the congressional delegation voted against entry into the war. Uh, some did support U.S. intervention, uh, but others did not, particularly German Americans, uh, particularly agrarian populists uh, who sought uh, more isolationist stance, uh, and also among labor leaders, uh, particularly 
in the lead and zinc mines here in southwestern Missouri. So given a small federal government, given a divided country, how then did this mobilization actually take place? Much greater and much faster than any of the European powers expected. Much to the surprise, in fact, of the Germans, who never thought the Americans would be a threat to them. And here, I turn to words that uh, just came out of me in my research, came out of me from the archives. Uh, ideas of obligation, words, of, uh, uh, words like duty, responsibility, uh, obligation, and uh, debt. Uh, and these kinds of uh, notions were ones that actually did much more work in mobilizing Americans than the way we usually talk about politics, which involves the language of rights, of freedoms, and liberties. In clubs, schools, churches, and workplaces, Americans articulated their political obligations. They articulated them as obligations, as something owed, as a debt to be paid. And through those institutions, they governed each other and mobilized each other during the war. <coughs> now, this could, uh, this could go too far. And sometimes it did. Over the course of the war, Americans engaged in acts of coercion against their fellow countrymen and women in order to enforce these understandings of the duties of citizenship. Some of these were violent, some not. Some were within the terms of the law, some not. All of them were sort of wrapped up in sort of uh, conflicted ideas about what the obligations of citizenship were. There were ones that were private and minor, what one German-American recalled as handshakes less vigorous than they used to be. Uh, they could also be public and violent. Uh, in a small town in Montana, a guy named Vess Hall got roughed up after he criticized the draft and called President Wilson a tool. In a Kansas town, uh, Mennonite conscientious objectors were publicly shaved, wrapped in the American flag, and paraded down the streets to the town square. Over the course of the war, Americans partly in response to what they saw as too much violence on the home front, turned increasing amounts of power over to state institutions, <coughs> particularly at the federal level. In the end, whether they were some of the four million men drafted under the Selective Service Act, or the tens of millions of home front volunteers, or if they counted themselves uh, as some of the thousands of conscientious objectors, or uh, German enemy aliens, Americans of the World War I era created a new state and new ways of being American citizens and found new ways to live under an increasingly powerful federal government. They learned effectively to live with Uncle Sam, but it's important to remember that they were the ones who had created Uncle Sam in the first place. And that's what I want to talk to you about tonight, drawing <coughs> on three main examples. Uh, first, by looking at conscription, the, the implementation of the draft in World War I, then touching uh, on women's voluntary service, and particularly the conservation of food, and third, by looking at the experience of German Americans and German enemy aliens during the course of the war. And most of my examples will come from sort of all across America, but I've tried to bring in specific examples uh, from Missouri and from South of Missouri whenever possible. So let me start, actually, with selective service. Selective Service Act of May 1917, uh, the first sort of large-scale universal conscription uh, in the United States. What you see here is a picture of the Secretary of War uh, drawing the first capsules, the, the first numbers in the draft uh, lottery uh, in the summer of 1917 after the first registration. Now, the Selective Service Act is a perfect example of the relationship between volunteerism and state power, rights and obligations during the First World War. The draft did not come easily to the United States, even though the idea of universal male military service was not unknown. The Civil War saw a draft in both the Union and the Confederacy, but these systems uh, were uh, set, these systems sent relatively few men into the Civil War armies. There were violent uprisings against them in the North, widespread desertion in the South. In fact, only 8% of the Union military force came from conscription. So the draft was something new, uh, if not entirely unprecedented, when the, the U.S. entered the war in April of 1917. When that happened, the United States had already been having a debate about military service, about how big the army should be, and how it should be recruited, who should serve. Advocates of so-called preparedness pushed for universal service as a tool of national unity 
they thought that if everyone served, it would make everyone uh, sort of more American, more alike. On the other side, members of the progressive movement formed the coalition to re resist this linkage of military service and national citizenship. But it was not just a philosophical debate. The federal government and its branches, uh, both military and civilian, lacked the capacity in 1917 to handle such a massive mobilization project. The War Department simply could not have instituted the draft that preparedness advocates advocated. Just to give you an example, in an era before driver's licenses or social security cards, when passports and even birth certificates were still quite rare, the simple identification of the nation's citizens was a task beyond the capacity of any government, federal, state, or local. So these political debates and bureaucratic limits came together in the compromise of the Selective Service Act of 1917. The law required all male citizens of draft age and all male aliens who had taken out the first papers of citizenship, what we would now call the green card, were required to register with their local draft boards. Now everyone had to register. The liability to registration was universal. But the liability to service was, in the language of that day and of ours, selective. A man's health, his engagement in a useful war industry, uh, or his obligations to dependent family members determined whether he would be called to serve. Volunteerism played a crucial part in the spirit of selective service. Now the, you can see that the, the uh, registration process is being cast as a volunteer service to the state, something you would volunteer to serve. And that the government would do the selecting based on principles of fairness and efficiency. It gives the draft an aura of consent and of voluntary participation. And thus we get from this uh, President Woodrow Wilson, who spoke of the spirit of selective service, and gave us one of the more puzzling uh, quotes from the World War I era, when he describes uh, the draft. And he says, it is in no sense a conscription of the unwilling. It is a selection from a nation which has volunteered in mass. <laughs> Uh, now, how do you get a nation to volunteer in mass? That's a, that's a question uh, that needs to be answered. Most of the, of the 24 million men who registered under the Selective Service Act between uh, 1917 and the end of the war did so without dissent. Others, however, were reluctant to let the state make such coercive claims. About 64,000 registered as conscientious objectors and either refused to participate or sought alternative forms of service. Many more, perhaps as many as 350,000, dodged the draft and became, in the slang of the period, slackers. And these men uh, were, would have to be sort of coerced into volunteering, coerced into joining the nation that had volunteered in mass. And over the course of the war, pro-war Americans engaged in a wide range of activities to ensure that the nation volunteered in mass. Often, prefiguring or sort of advancing uh, activities long before anyone in Washington had proposed them as policies. Rather than a top-down project uh, of the state, these systems of, of enforcement were typically the outcomes of local conflicts over power and civic duty, in which the federal government was just one among many competing institutions of authority. Now, just to give uh, you know, some, some examples of this, uh, just for example, racial and class fault lines in any community would make a big difference in how the draft was enforced. In the urban Northeast, for example, immigrant communities long associated with labor radicalism were also targeted as slacker towns, from the French Canadians of East Portland, Maine, to the German Americans of Milwaukee and St. Louis. In industrial centers of Connecticut, immigrant labor groups faced the voluntary armed hostility of the state's home guard made up almost exclusively of native-born Americans and dominated by the state's elite families. In the South, uh, you see uh, repressive measures again aimed at resistant black workers and disproportionate enforcement of the draft against African Americans, despite the fact that draft evasion rates were probably similar across the color line. In the Mountain West, where labor turmoil and Toronto Park mining communities in the years before the war, Nearly every state passed laws forbidding radical organizing. But at times, guaranteeing fairness and universality 
um, was not just a matter of passing a law, uh, but a turn toward specifically federal intervention. And we see a groundswell of support across the country for the expansion of state power. Some simply asked the state to distribute political obligations more evenly. And these were some of the most interesting letters that I read in my research. During the course of the war, literally thousands of letters arrived at Selective Service headquarters alleging slackerism or disloyalty on the part of neighbors, colleagues, and even family members. These letters were not uh, manifestations of wartime hysteria. Uh, these letters are, I think, symbols of people participating in a political process. People uh, participating in a process whose fairness could only be guaranteed if it was universal. They thought the draft would only be fair if everyone actually registered. And knowing that it's hard to know who everyone is, uh, you have to kind of make sure that that universality is, is enforced, that their universal registration is enforced. Uh, in St. Louis, a woman named Edna Shaw wrote to draft officials to turn in her friend, Otto Schlafwitzel. I wouldn't say anything about it, she wrote, only he is so disloyal for only being 24 years of age and single. He is hurting my feelings when he talks about the country, because I have brothers in service, and I will almost think if I only had a gun, I would kill him. <laughs> <laughs> Emma Wolschendorf of East Bridgewater, Massachusetts, wrote to the draft board in May 1918, asking them to draft her husband. <laughs> he is not a good father to his two little babies, and therefore I want our great uncle Sam to take care of him. <laughs> uh, so this is one of those letters that uh, you realize is, a, is someone participating in a political process. But it's also, if you think about it, you know, this is someone who, um, we don't know what her marriage was like, what her family was like, but something was wrong. And now she has an avenue. Uh, to make a claim on the state, a new avenue for redress. And you see people responding very quickly to new sort of new ways of making political claims. And this is just one of them. Now, the selective service system claimed to lay out a universal obligation, but in fact it constantly made distinctions among them. That's what the system was designed to do. To distinguish them along the lines of age, occupation, family status, and so forth. Now, to ordinary Americans like Edna Shaw and Emma Wolschendorf, giving themselves over to the spirit of selective service required, in return, confirmation that the government was doing its part to make sure the draft age men were being honest. And if the government would not, then they would step in and be enforcing themselves. Now, not all social practices to enforce the draft were quite so uh, coercive or even uh, targeted uh, at, at the state because its mechanism. Some were more personal, involving social pressures within families and communities that drew on the multiple obligations and the multiple social networks that Americans have. Parents often accompany children to draft registration centers, where both parents and children received registration buttons that they were asked to wear prominently on their lapels. Right? And so I don't know what your parents are like, uh, but if I had been without one, uh, I would have been asked. The wartime draft uh, also attached the nation state to the bodies of draft age men in the form of draft cards. And these are the first mass state issued identity documents in American history. And men were legally bound to carry them at all times and show them upon request. Churches read out the names of members of their congregations who had registered for the draft, a process ostensibly aimed at honoring the registrants, but which also acted to ensure compliance. Local newspapers were also involved. In the small town of Moose Up, Connecticut, the local paper listed the names of men who were expected to appear on a particular day for induction into the army. It also listed the names of alternates who would have to go if one of the, if one of the men listed did not show up. So needless to say, uh, the alternates uh, rarely uh, were needed in the town where everyone's name was known. Now, just to give another example, here in Joplin, uh, during, uh, what, uh, right before an episode of what was called entrainment, which is when sort of soldiers get onto the trains to go to military camps, local leaders hosted a massive state dinner at the sort of notorious uh, or famous uh, House of Lords restaurant for all of the men who had been called up for service. 
and once again, an action that honored those who served, but also marked out those who evaded. Uh, during the war, the corner of Fort and Maine was an empty, uh, was an empty lot, uh, where their uh, saloon had recently been torn down. Uh, and this became, over the course of the war, Liberty Lot, right? um, where a giant thermostat measured the success of, of war bond rallies. Those who subscribed were given a Liberty Loan button, and those who refused were put on the slacker list. So your name would be on, uh, you know, if you didn't buy a bond, your name would be on, on a wall uh, on the corner of the floor. Now, citizens also came up with their own definitions of draft evasion. This is not quite for the main, but it's right, uh, it's right here. There. Uh, the building I'm now told is where the uh, was the first national uh, first national bank building. Uh, citizens also came up with their own definitions of draft evasion. In Worcester, Massachusetts, a French Canadian machinist. Uh, who had had an exemption from the draft. He was a skilled worker in the war industry, so he was uh, exempt from the draft. He appeared before his local draft board asking to be reclassified as draftable, saying, my girl says it's all bunk, this line of talk of me being more use here than in the army. If I don't go into the army, she won't marry me. She's right, and you've got to put me back in class one. Now, the board refused and told him to go back to the factory uh, and go back to work. And soon thereafter, the young man's girlfriend appeared before the draft board. And she said, I don't care how many classes you have or what the rules say. Down my way, all single fellows between 21 and 31 are divided into just two classes, those who go and those who don't go. That's my classification. Now, if he don't go, I'm through with him. He simply has got to go. <laughs> the board bowed to her request and reclassified the man. And he soon found himself in uniform. Um, happily, he also returned from the war safe and sound. I don't know whether they ever actually got married. <laughs> so here, once again, we see people sort of you know making their own definitions, uh, making their own terms of fairness and citizenship and equality, and in doing so, uh, remaking America, remaking terms of what it means to be an American citizen. Now, these dynamics were not limited uh, to draft age men and selective servants. For American women, the war brought new attention to their volunteerism. And here, it's worth, I think, stopping to think about what we mean when we use the word volunteer. Because in fact, actually, it has several different definitions. Uh, in fact, in the political sense, we think often think of it in three different ways. First, we think of volunteers as people who are doing something that the government isn't doing. Right? That, you know, instead of the government doing it, we will have volunteers do it. And that's one definition of volunteers. Second uh, definition of volunteerism is somehow that it's not coerced, that it's willing. Right? You volunteer, you choose, come forward to do. The third definition of volunteerism uh, is that it's unpaid, that you do it for free. Right? So it's not a job, it's a volunteer, it's volunteerism. Right? Now, all of those are at work when we talk about volunteerism on the home front during World War I, but they have somewhat different meanings for American women. Right? particularly in the political sense, at a time when women are still largely excluded from the vote. Right? And so the terms of, their, of, of saying they are volunteering, they are doing something the government is not, has a different meaning for women than it does for men, who could also act through the state. And also, with that third definition, unpaid. Women had a long and centuries, <laughs> millennia long tradition of performing unpaid labor um, in their families and their communities. Uh, in ways that, that, that the war happened. And we can see American women's organizations coming to the foreground during the war to mobilize the home. Uh, and you can see this in almost any area of American life uh, across the, the, the political spectrum in almost every region. I just want to sort of draw attention to two, two individuals that I think were particularly uh, interesting kind of local figures. First, uh, oh, here we have some volunteers. These are people called Yomanets. Uh, so this, about uh, 50,000 women served in uniform uh, with the U.S. military over the course of the war. Uh, but the vast majority of women who volunteered did so in a civilian status. Uh, one, and this is a picture from much later than World War I, is uh, as Joplin's own, uh, Emily Newell Blair, who was one of the leading figures in the Women's uh, Committee 
the Council of National Defense, a Washington-based sort of organization designed to coordinate all uh, home front voluntary organizations uh, who later had a, a leading national political, uh, political role. Another uh, from St. Louis, a woman named Julia Catherine Stimson, uh, who went to uh, went to France as part of as, as part of the uh, the base hospital 21, which is organized by Washington University, and later uh, by the end of the war had become the head of the Army Nurse Corps, and the first uh, woman to achieve the rank of major in the U.S. military. Now, women's organizations did not only participate actively in the war effort. It also shaped the terms on which that war was waged. Take, for example, the conservation of food. Now, the U.S. did not have rationing during World War I. Uh, the, the conditions were never so extreme for that, and most people in the Wilson administration knew that such policies would be incredibly unpopular. So they avoided that whenever possible, um, except for some restrictions on, on sugar, uh, among other things. But there was a massive campaign uh, at the voluntary conservation of vital foodstuffs, which is like you can see here in this poster. And included um, a house-to-house -house canvas of nearly every home in the United States asking Americans to sign a food pledge, asking them to sort of pledge to use less meat, uh, to conserve more, to save uh, and, and, and uh, not, uh, you know, not take things away from the soldiers, and also not to hoard uh, uh, commodities as they came on the market. Things like sugar and butter uh, that people might want to hold on to. Uh, now, over the course of the war, over four, 14 million households took the food pledge. And that pledge was given before volunteers of the U.S. Food Administration, almost every single one of them a woman. And this was a sort of massive, sort of face to face political mobilization that is not just a kind of symbolic pledge, but also had political consequences. Uh, and in particular, political consequences for those women who did not sign the food pledge. Uh, and there was some resistance. Um, one, just to give an example, uh, one woman thought of the matter in political terms. She said, as a being with no political rights in Massachusetts, meaning not, no right to vote, I fail to see why my signature on one of your cards would have the slightest weight. And she refused. Others resented the invasion of their personal liberty and feared that signing the pledge meant that they would have to hand over all of their hand goods uh, to the things that they stopped up. In the small town of Savannah, Missouri, Mrs. Workfall refused to sign on the grounds that, quote, she, that she, quote, didn't think this is a free country anymore. And another Missouri woman released her dogs when the pledge volunteers came by. <laughs> and one went so far as to tell the pledge volunteers that, quote, if we would give a car to her, she would wipe her butt with it. She wasn't going to feed rich people. <laughs> so, some things change, some, some never change. Uh, but what you can see here is a contest over the terms of the state uh, and uh, also a demand that every person, not just every male citizen between 18 and 45, but that every person locate him or herself before Uncle Sam. In this case, Uncle Sam was not that old man in the little fitting suit. Uncle Sam was a woman from the local community asking for the signature on the pledge drive. But it's no less powerful than that fact. And in fact, maybe more powerful because there is already a connection with that person asking you for a signature, already a set of social networks in which you are operating. Now, the, ent the entry into, of the U.S. into the First World War also presented a political crisis for German Americans, German citizens and Americans of uh, German descent, in part because it created a crisis for the category of citizenship itself. If citizenship is now suddenly very much at stake. What does that mean for those who are not, for those who are outside that category, and particularly for those who are citizens of the nation with which the United States is at war? And following in the wake of several high-profile attempts by German agents at sabotage and espionage, almost all of them spectacularly unsuccessful, the United States government and the American people more generally placed German Americans under official and unofficial surveillance uh, in a way that led to a disaster uh, of social relations that I think our uh, history textbooks exclude uh, and that our society has never really uh, confronted uh, in the decades since.
the war, uh, the war led many Americans to find ways to turn uh, citizenship into a set of obligations. Right? Once again, asking people to locate themselves before Uncle Sam, to say what their place in this war effort was. Um, and in particular, to ask from German Americans uh, the affirmation of a single identity, a single national identity, and the disavowal not only of their German legal citizenship, if they had it, but also their German cultural belonging, if they had that as well. Um, you see laws passed demanding uh, loyalty oaths of teachers and government employees, laws outlawing the speaking of German in schools, in political forums, in religious services, and even on the telephone. During the course of World War I, the U.S. government returned approximately 6,000 persons uh, of German citizenship. Wartime immigration officials turned the empty halls of Ellis Island into a mass detention center for any <coughs> aliens of German citizenship. And voluntary associations signed on, drafting plans for a possible mass internment of German Americans nationwide, and assisting in the construction of powerful new state institutions regulating immigration and political subversion. And these institutions, um, just as much as the army, as the welfare state, as, as economic regulation, are just as important for understanding the 20th century American government that uh, emerged from the war as, a, as any of those. Germans were regulated, required to register, some were interned. In communities across the country, there were violent assaults on German culture and institutions and associations. This happened everywhere, and it certainly happened in this state. The Missouri Council of Defense sought to block the teaching of German in schools for its use in religious services. The number of newspapers published in German cut uh, by half over the course of the war. Two counties, Cass and Lynn counties, banned the use of German on the telephone. And it also happened here in southwestern Missouri as well. Uh, the German insurance company in downtown uh, Joplin was the, the victim of the vandalism attack. The German American Bank of Springfield was renamed the American Savings Bank. And here in Joplin, Germania Hall was closed and its funds donated to the Red Cross. But what was striking were the ways in which, uh, in fact, German Americans learned to regulate themselves as obedient citizens. And in fact, in the book I trace, ways that, in fact, Germans regulated themselves, many of them sort of across the lines of generations uh, between. Germans and, and, their, and their German American children, and, and found new places for themselves in American society. Germania Hall was not shut down by the police, it was shut down actually by its own members who voted to close it. And an interesting fact uh, that shows this is that when census takers came around in 1920 uh, to do their sort of census count for, for, the, for the United States, they found 8.16 million German speakers. This was a decrease of 5.6% in, in a decade, the only language to show a decline. So what this shows uh, is that over the course of 1910 to 1920, right, the number of people who say uh, that, the, that German is their native language dropped by 5.6%. They also found that among all ethnic groups in 1920, the Germans had the highest percentage of naturalized citizens, about 74%. And so if any ethnic group in America uh, the most likely to be naturalized in 1910 was not Germans. The most likely to be naturalized in 1920 was. Anyone who had the chance to rush to the naturalization office did so. Most remarkable was the suggestion of the data that there had been a drop of 25% in the previous 10 years in the number of people who said that they were born in Germany. <laughs> now, statisticians will tell you the only possible explanation that they lied to their census takers. That, in fact, they lied to Uncle Sam. But whether they lied to themselves, we cannot know. Now, let me just uh, bring the story toward the end. The war's end came on um, November 11, 1918. And it came here in Jocelyn, the news came by the telephone. Uh, and it reached Willett Lopton, uh, who was the night telephone operator. This was a time uh, when you couldn't make a telephone call without actually talking to the operator. Uh, so they always needed one on hand. She got the news at 2.50 a.m. And she reacted 
by calling every name in the phone book. Just <laughs> <laughs> sort of working your way down through and just saying the war is over and hanging up. <laughs> now festivities broke out across the city and in response to parade, people sort of uh, you know would bring sort of you know tin tin pots out of their kitchens and beat them, uh, and make noise. Um, and uh, veterans of the Civil War, uh, sort of aging veterans of the Civil War, marched through the city streets. Um, but there was not, uh, there was plenty of celebration that day, but it was coming after a time when there was not necessarily a, a lot of celebration, um, because it in fact actually coming right around the same time as the influenza epidemic, um, which mostly hit this era before the armistice. Um, it reached the U.S. Uh, in general in September of 1918, uh, by early 1919, over 600,000 Americans had died, 73 of them here in Joplin. Interestingly, uh, nearly as many as the 83 men who died in service during the course of the war. So in many ways, the, the epidemic sort of brings uh, much of the celebration, much of the victory to raise to a, a very quick halt. And the Americans never really got to mark the end of the war in quite the ways that they wanted. Uh, there were some big events like this, the American Legion Parade in front of Kansas City that you see here in 1921. By 1924, the Liberty Lock was gone, along with its thermostat and its slacker list, replaced by the stately Liberty Building uh, that now stands at the lock. At its dedication, local residents could pause to ask what the war had been about, what were its consequences. And here we could stop to think about that as well. Now, American society has been transformed, although not always in visible ways. And viewed in long-term perspective, America's first world war was obviously less significant than the war endured in Europe. The United States lost some 126,000 soldiers, about 50,000 of them in combat. Germany, Russia, and France each counted their dead in the millions. So the, American, the impact of the United States was far less. The war left fewer scars on the men who did survive the war. A few months in a dusty training camp was a far cry from four years in a muddy ditch. Nor was the First World War as transformative as the second. World War II was obviously longer and more intensive and did far more to reshape the structures of American politics, economics, and social relations. But much did change. Uh, and certainly, when Americans talked about what changed, they talked about the government. And in the early 20th century, when Americans talked about government, they used a capital letter G to talk about it. And certainly, government, in that sense, got bigger during the war. And in many areas, stayed that way, with a standing army, a growing apparatus of surveillance and policing, a nascent welfare state, practice in managing the relations between labor and capital, and even experienced levying an income tax. This new state had new concerns. Some were global, as the post-war Red Scare sphere of Bolshevism blossomed into the 20th century's Cold War. Others, particularly the federal prohibition of alcohol, managed the boundaries between federal and local, between the private citizen and the public good. The American polity had changed. The nation's voting rolls doubled as suffragists celebrated the ratification of the 19th Amendment in 1920. And even the American people themselves had changed. Submarine warfare had all but closed off transatlantic migration after 1914, a social fact codified into a legal fact by immigration restriction acts adopted in 1917, 21, and 24 that shaped the fundamental demographic character of American society for two generations. So America was very much changed. Now, let me end this evening by talking about two people who are not in this book. Uh, and the first is a name uh, that I'm hoping you, uh, someone here tonight uh, can teach me a little bit about. Uh, his name is Harry Rankin Taylor, or Talbot, uh, from Jasper. Okay. Uh, he was a soldier in the First World War. He was the victim of a chemical gas attack. Um, and in fact, barely survived the war at all. He returned to Jasper um, and lived the entire rest of his life there, uh, where he spent most of his life uh, as the cust chief custodian of the Jasper Public Schools. 
And after he died uh, in 1961, a new building at the school, the Tabler or Tabler Gymnasium, I don't even know how to pronounce it, so someone will teach me, um, was named in his honor. Uh, and I want to know whether that story is remembered, uh, whether the gymnasium exists, um, and in fact, um, whether or whether it has been forgotten, uh, or whether it is gone, like the canvas. Uh, that used to stand on the lawn of Carthage Memorial Hall, which were melted down in 1942 for scrap metal in the mobilization for the second World War. Now, the second person that I want to talk about is Frank Woodruff Hawkins. He was born in Bethany, Missouri in 1901. He volunteered for service in 1916 at the age of 15, at a time when the United States had not even entered the war. He was told by a recruiter that the ambulance service was the quickest way to get to France, and he joined an international ambulance unit that served the British and French armies. He did some of the war's dirtiest and surely some of its most disheartening work, especially trained in something called trench casualty retrieval. Buckles carried wounded men out of the muck and filth of the trenches to the makeshift hospitals set up behind enemy lines where far too few of them survived. Buckles, though, did. He returned home at the war's end, along with 1.3 million men and about 20,000 women who volunteered and served in the U.S. Armed Forces abroad. In February 2011, Frank Buckles died at his family's farm near Charlestown, West Virginia, and was buried at Halloween National Cemetery. He was 110 years old. And he was the last surviving veteran of the First World War, not only from the United States, but from any of the world nations. With him, not that long ago, passed the final living memories of the men and women at whom Uncle Sam first pointed and announced in those memorable words, I want you. Buckles is gone, but the task of remembering the war remains with us. Thank you. Uh, but it does, it, it did pass. Uh, 
Uh, it would have passed anyway at some point, <coughs> but, uh, but I do think that the war, and in particular the ways that women restated their claims to citizenship, was, was actually crucial. Yeah? Um, if you, uh, you referred to the Supreme Court What's that? How did I find this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So letters. They are all um, just sitting in boxes um, uh, at the National Archives in Washington. Um, so those those letters, those kind of petition letters, are, are all there. Um, some materials are actually spread out at the kind of branch offices of the National Archives, uh, of which I think there is one in Kansas City. I'm not mistaken. Um, uh, but they don't have like they're not the really juicy letters. <laughs> uh, and that a lot has now also been digitized, right? and, and so you know my hope is that as this uh, you know Missouri over there project uh, expands, that will be one place to look. Uh, through uh, commercial sites like Ancestry, you can get a, a, some of these things, not the correspondence, but the registration form. Uh, and then through open sources, uh, you know there's there's a lot more is increasingly available. Uh, one really fascinating. Uh, digitized source that I used was in Virginia. Uh, they had a, what's called the Virginia War Questionnaire, and they sent to every soldier uh, after the war and asked them, you know, different questions. And most of the questions were really, really boring, um, and, you know, and you know, sort of questions. And one of them, but the one that uh, I think they didn't expect to be all that interesting was they said, "Did the war test your religious faith?" And it was the one that got the longest and most interesting answers. Um, and you know, it was really uh, you know someone should just do, should do a book just on on the answer to that to that questionnaire. You know, it's a really kind of fascinating. Question. And those are all available on all of those questions. Yeah, in the back. You got it. Yeah. Um, you said uh, that the German American citizens began to regulate themselves during this time, and it seems like from looking at the, the census numbers, that was a fairly significant transformative event. Did that happen strictly as a reaction to the restrictions that were being put in place externally, or did they start to do that kind of on their own before any of that happened? Um, I think it was really a it was a defensive response to uh, to, to the criticisms, to, to the threats, uh, and so forth. Uh, and you know, German Americans were on on their way to assimilation anyway. You know, and most second generation, third generation speaking English or going to religious services in English, <coughs> going to school in English. Uh, so in that sense, the war only accelerates a trend that was going to happen anyway. Uh, but you definitely see uh, people you know, responding to, to fears that have not yet, or threats that have not yet been made at them. So people uh, literally writing to the newspapers that they, the German language newspapers that they subscribe to, saying, please cancel my subscription, I'm afraid afraid to get the newspaper. I don't want my neighbors to see and, uh, and I, you know, it's definitely coming from the point. Yes, sir? You, you know, you think it was probably fortunate in history, from a historical standpoint that over in the Navy Department was a staffer named Roosevelt that may have learned something about running war. Uh, now, that's a very good question. So, right, the question was, uh, you know, what was it, a, was it you know, useful uh, that uh, the young man named Franklin Roosevelt was an assistant secretary of the Navy uh, during uh, the First World War? Uh, and I, I think I'm not quite sure what the answer is to that. I know, uh, I haven't looked myself, I know that historians disagree about whether he learned something useful there uh, or whether they just kind of kept him busy there. Right? Remember at this point, um, in his life, FDR was a kind of a, a kind of spoiled rich boy, uh, and in many ways, the test of his character comes with his polio uh, you know, affliction. Uh, that kind of brings him, uh, you know, brings out some of the better uh, better sides of, of, of his leadership. He, he did learn from the Liberty lot where they sold uh, bonds to to get a good bond uh, campaign going. He used to, he used to drive, uh, drive during the Depression and the, and the World War II that uh, 
<coughs> don't worry about the big debt that we're running up because we owe it to ourselves. And that that that, that makes a big difference when you when you think how many billions uh, were involved. Yeah. No, that's true. And if the World War II bond drives are very clearly patterned after the World War I bond drives. Uh, and, but there's a big debate during the war about whether to finance it with bonds or with taxes. And this actually turns into a kind of philosophical debate about whether, you know, which generation should bear the burden. Uh, you know, is, uh, is, is our bonds or deficits passing the burden of a war onto a generation that didn't vote to go to war for it? Um, and you know, how do you kind of reconcile that? And that's a conversation that happened in World War I. Uh, it's a conversation we don't generally have in the United States uh, anymore. And we probably should. Yes? Uh, prior to the Italian withdrawal from the war, um, given the population of German and Italians in the United States, how close do you think that the United States was to favoring the central powers for, over the Entente? Uh, so the question, I, if everybody heard it, was about you know uh, what was the, the chance of the U.S. Uh, favoring the central powers, uh, and I think the chance is about zero. Uh, uh, certainly, the chance of the United States entering on their side uh, was probably always zero. Uh, but there might have been other ways in which the United States could have um, pursued its neutrality more honestly, neutrally. Uh, so, you know, during the period of neutrality, um, we were rarely actually neutral. Right? Uh, we made a series of efforts that uh, increasingly committed us to, particularly to supporting Britain. Uh, that the U.S. could have, uh, you know, had a more neutral stance. But I, I can't, uh, certainly within the Wilson administration, the State Department, uh, the military, uh, no one, I think, uh, thought seriously about entering on this. Yes. How did uh, the Selective Service actually make their selection, you know, other than the appeals of individual girlfriends? <laughs> uh, so how did they, you know, so distinguish among these different men? Well, how did they make the selection? Like, you know, you sh showed a picture, but it wasn't clear how they were making their, how, would, how they were using it, All right. you know, set of uh, registrants and selecting individuals. Yeah. So the numbers that they pick are um, are birth dates, uh, right? Just like how the draft has worked in, in almost all of, all of its 20, 20th century versions. Uh, and then when the red, um, so a registrant would then get a kind of call up. Uh, that call, at the call up, there would be a medical examination so, uh, to make sure that you were physically fit. Uh, and then a lot of questions about your occupation. Uh, that by this point, when the U.S. enters the war, they've learned from the other nations, particularly from Britain, that it's crucial to maintain your industrial and agricultural workforce at home. Right? So in many ways, the draft is put in place to stop people from volunteering, rather than actually to get them uh, into the ranks. But they're just as concerned with keeping farmers on the farm as they are with you know, keep getting other people into the uh, So most of the questions were about occupation. Um, then there were a series of other questions about dependents. Right? If you had, technically, if you had anyone dependent on you, you could claim an exemption. Um, so whether you had children, a spouse, uh, parents, uh, or anything. Um, so there were questions like that. Um, although many people waived that exemption as, as often as not. Um, and then uh, they also did, a, you know, in addition to the medical exam, they also did psychological exams including uh, the very first versions of what we now call IQ tests. And in fact, even the SAT uh, sort of traces its history back to, to the testing that was done on the soldiers right before World War And then from there, they would try to get a sort of quota. You know, they would have to kind of keep going down that list of birthdays. And so they would, uh, at the quotas which were assigned by state. Yes? You are the recipient of a rather prestigious award, very prestigious award, from Lois Rennick. She herself has written probably more than one, but one fascinating book that I'm familiar with, which uh, instead of 
concentrating on political implications, as your book does, apparently, like to read it, uh, talks about the cultural and psychological effect on this country of that war. And I'd like you to just comment a bit on that. Changed people enormously. And this, in turn, uh, going to another earlier question, uh, reflects on uh, the suffrage movement. Yeah, no, this is a, uh, um, this is a, uh, you know, part of what's sort of not in the book, uh, uh, or maybe not in the talk, some, some of it's in the book, um, is sort of how this plays out in the realms of, of culture, more, culture broadly speaking, right? So, um, as well as culture um, defined as sort of literature, the arts, uh, and so forth. And you can certainly see that uh, in the ways that people who were in in art, the arts and literature felt this as a, as a period of great constraint. So all of these laws that restricted political speech, espionage, and sedition acts were sometimes also targeted at, at, at novels, at, at political cartoons, at works of art. Um, and that, that was one way in which artists felt that their expression was limited, and many of them started to see expression as more political. Uh, and that was already going on in the kind of bohemian movements of Greenwich Village and other things. The 1910s, it really kind of takes up uh, more more energy uh, as you get into say the 1920s. Now, the standard story um, in the kind of cultural realm is of disillusion, the lost generation, uh, Fitzgerald and Hemingway, and I think that's absolutely true. That that was their that was their experience, uh, and what the war did to that, particularly those who went uh, went to it. Uh, but I think there's also a way in which Americans, um, in which that doesn't describe all Americans' experience, um, their sort of emotional, their psychological experience. Um, that for many of them, um, this was a period, particularly on the home front, that, uh, that felt uh, frightening, uh, invasive, uh, very uncertain, um, and something about which they felt somewhat uneasy and embarrassed afterwards. Uh, and, which is, I think, in part why a lot of people don't think whether they were German Americans or whether they were the ones arguing German Americans didn't necessarily talk about these chapters. And for me, the most persuasive kind of literary representation of the home front on the First World War is a novella by Catherine Porter called Pale Horse Cat Wagger, um, which used to be very well known and it's not really much read now, but it should be. And it's set uh, during the influenza epidemic of uh, 1980 also very much covered for four years. And I think, for me, it really helped me understand uh, the kind of, uh, the sort of sense of unease that a lot of Americans felt during the war, about sort of not really knowing what was happening and feeling that things were happening very fast. Uh, that someone was just sort of, that they were doing things often because someone, some neighbor had told them to do something. That she really kind of captures that and very, makes it very helpful. Uh, for me, matters a lot. Yeah. Uh, two questions. Uh, did the flu epidemic affect the military establishment in the rest of the population? Yes, worse. And another question was uh, the reverse of the German and the German and the war. How did that compare to the Japanese? Okay, so there are two questions. The first was uh, whether the influenza epidemic affected uh, soldiers more than civilians. In fact, it was far worse for soldiers for two reasons. First, uh, they tended to live in more cramped quarters, so they spread it to each other more easily. And second, um, that particular epidemic, the mortality rates for, were actually highest among young, young adults, um, partly because they think that older Americans had already been uh, exposed to some early you know, mild version of that strain. Um, and so the death rates for young adults were, were very high, and so that's why death rates for young adult soldiers were, were particularly high. Uh, and then the second question uh, on the, so I always want to make clear when I talk about the internment of German enemy aliens during the First World War, uh, was that it's, it's actually something quite different from the internment of Japanese Americans during the Second 
Uh, first, the numbers are off by orders of magnitude, about 6,000 Germans, about 120,000 during the Second World War. Uh, and secondly, uh, every, every German who was interned was interned according to internationally accepted principles of law. Uh, it is perfectly legitimate during a time of war uh, to put restrictions, uh, regulations, even in terms of the citizens of the nation that you are at war with. Uh, and, that, and, and we know that that was not the case with the Japanese Americans. Many of them were, in fact, US citizens, the majority. Uh, and during the First World War, uh, the US, when it interned Germans, had, uh, had an appeals process. If you was, wanted to claim you were not, uh, you know, you were not a German citizen, if you wanted to you know, make some sort of claim that you should not be interned, there was a formal appeals procedure. Whereas the internment of Japanese Americans during the Second World War had no, had no sort of uh, due process procedure. So I think they're actually they're actually quite different. That said, that doesn't mean that, that this was insignificant. And, and, you know, that it wasn't you know, something that we need to kind of know more about. Ah, was it common for teenage boys to go to war, or was it controversial, or did Americans just accept it as normal? Right. Uh, you mean sort of younger, you know, under draft age men mm -hmm. like Frank Buckles, or, or just in general? Like teenage boys, yeah. Um, it, was, it was technically illegal to join the army or any of the services if you were not 18. Uh, and for a while there was an exception that said if, you, if your parents let you, you could. Uh, but uh, then, they, then they said, well, no, we, you know, we don't want to do that either. And so there was you know, certainly a, a question about whether it, was, you know, whether it was OK. It's important to remember, at this time in American history, you know, most 16, 17, 18-year-old young men are already working. Right? Uh, you know, college, college rates are, what, maybe 8%? are going to college, and most are not finishing high school. So it was you know, less shocking, I think, to, to the, the idea of a 16-year-old or something you know, going into, into the service uh, than, than it might be now, where we expect everyone, in fact, we can't get into the service without finishing high school. Right? So, so things have changed. Yes? Uh, do you think, in retrospect, that World War I uh, really brought about the beginning of wrongly decided uh, free speech cases um, you know, with uh, anarchists, war protesters, socialists, Bolsheviks, that uh, as much as I like Woodrow Wilson, uh, in the areas of civil liberties and free speech, I don't think this is his strongest suit. Uh, no, no, it's certainly not his uh, strongest suit. And I think, uh, you know, this, the, there was a civil liberties movement during the First World War, uh, which lost more battles than it won, by far, uh, for, uh, in all different kinds of areas, like the ones you, you lay out, for the labor, for, uh, for uh, pacifists, critics of, of the draft or anything like that. Uh, but they also, in some ways, this is you know, not very good compensation for them, but it, you know, it, it, it forced them to articulate their arguments and, and to kind of make their, make their arguments. Uh, and eventually, their arguments did come to succeed. Uh, now, and it's in, the, in this period that you see the birth of kind of most of the, the civil liberties organizations uh, of the 20th century. What start what now is the American Civil Liberties Union started as a as a counseling group for uh, drafted men on how to kind of how to fill out their paperwork uh, and so you sort of emerge from there to a much uh, much larger organization. So you certainly see that, and you also see um, this as the birthplace of the of the birth era of an argument that you know every individual should be able to say everything that he or she wants at every time. Right? Now, that argument didn't win. Yeah. And uh, it was not persuasive in the courts at that time. But notice, uh, just as you're creating uh, a modern state, 
you have a very powerful federal government. You also see arguments, very powerful arguments, for individualism and individual civil liberties. And I think those two are related. Right? The rise of the one requires you know, the kind of articulation of the other. Well, and to follow up with that, Uh, that, that is a great question. I uh, started this book uh, in part because I wanted to kind of recover that history of political obligations. Uh, that I feel like the way most Americans talk about their sort of civic understandings of themselves as citizens is about our rights and our freedoms. And, and if, we, if you ask people what obligations you have, you know, maybe you can come up with jury service. And around this time of year, you can come up with taxes. Uh, and, you know, maybe they'll think of the draft. Right? Um, but in fact, our obligations are, are just as important. Uh, and they may not necessarily be as, uh, you know, as obviously political. Just as our rights um, are not just our rights to vote, but also our rights to, to express ourselves and form organizations to kind of you know, be in civil society. So uh, I think that that sense of, obli of obligation and duty and responsibility has largely uh, eroded uh, over the 20th century. Uh, what has caused that is a, you know, is a mystery. Whether, uh, whether it would return if we need it, I, I think I have some faith uh, in that. Uh, but I think that that's, uh, you know, that is one of the striking things to kind of see in the First World War era, that, that language very much at work. We have time for one more. Okay. There is one more. One more? Right. Well, then let's go back to the very, very opening. You're going to speak this evening with uh, James Montgomery Fire. Now, before you talk this evening, I would have written a splendid little answer on Dr. Wagner's history exam that Thomas Nast would have made that, uh, made that poster. Any evidence that Nast was doing this in any way? Uh, so, just in case you didn't hear it, but uh, was there any influence that the that Thomas Nast, the cartoonist from uh, the 19th century, influenced uh, James Montgomery Flagg? I think only indirectly, in the sense that he was, you know, one of the best known cartoonists ever, uh, and you know, best known illustrators. Uh, there were some of the same publications that Flagg was drawing. So he surely would have known those. Uh, but it was, uh, you know, a couple decades after Nast had been working. And Flagg probably would have thought that his style, was, Nast's style was old fashioned, uh, you know, kind of too, uh, you know, too cluttered, and would have wanted a kind of cleaner, more modern, and sort of colorful look. Uh, you can see, uh, you can also, you can see this in some of the other posters um, that draw from kind of the advertising of the period, uh, the sort of famous Gibson girls, Others. So Gibson, Charles Gibson, who probably better known than Flagg, also did uh, World War One posters. And there, he basically took his advertising techniques and just turned them right over uh, to wartime work. But uh, you know, I think, and and then just one thing I, I thought I should also clarify: Flagg doesn't invent Uncle Sam. Uh, you know, Uncle Sam is a figure that was well known in the 19th century uh, during the Civil War. But if you look at visual images of Uncle Sam from before World War I, you see a real wide range of representations. And Flagg's image becomes the Uncle Sam during World War I, and pretty much stays that way. If you compare the way we draw Uncle Sam now to the, way, the many ways we might have drawn it in the 19th century. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.